Hi, welcome to another Sheepcorn Studios video. The first time I did Triumph of the Will, I was under lockdown and I was trying desperately to finish my course curriculum. The first time I did Triumph of the Will, it wasn't very good. The first time really lacked quality, but since it's my most popular video, I thought I would go back and redo my analysis of Triumph of the Will one part at a time. I hope you enjoy it, I hope you'll hit like and subscribe, and let's get started with Triumph of the Will Redo. So let's start off with the title, Triumph of the Will. Why is it called Triumph of the Will? This is actually drawing on the philosophical work of Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche laid out a philosophical principle called the will to power. Nietzsche really identifies this will to power as the motivating force behind all human activity. Nietzsche is also very famous for suggesting that society actually restrains the will, particularly of great individuals, and prevents them from being able to develop to the fullest extent of their capability. The Nazi party, and Adolf Hitler in particular, used this concept of the will to power to suggest that they needed to free themselves of societal agents of control that had limited the development of the pure and perfect society according to their ideology. Now, this is also significant because to a certain extent they're also misinterpreting Nietzsche's philosophy because they're conflating two concepts, Kraft and Macht. Kraft means force or strength, and so in other words, forcing your will onto another in order to achieve your outcome versus mocked, which also means power, but mocked also carries this connotation of overcoming the restrictions and restraints within one's self, which tends to be a lot more what Nietzsche is referring to. So the Nazis take this out of context and refer to their ascendancy into the control of Germany as the triumph of this ultimate will. It's significant to note that Triumph of the Will was ordered by Hitler after becoming the Fuhrer. Prior to being the Fuhrer, Hitler had been appointed by President von Hindenburg as the Chancellor of Germany in hopes of stopping the communist takeover that they thought was going to be happening here in the early part of 1933. However, President Hindenburg died, and when he did, Hitler went directly to the people of Germany to ask them for a plebiscite, which is a vote of yes or no, on whether or not they wanted him to combine the two offices of Chancellor and President into one now combined office of the Fuhrer. <laughs> World War I is something that looms huge in Nazi ideology. They feel slighted. They feel as though Germany is being held back. And again, that's the connection to Nietzsche's uh, concept of the will to power is that the other lesser nations than Germany are holding it back and restraining it through the Treaty of Versailles. And so the very first thing that they hit us with in Triumph of the Will is a reference back to this absolutely objectionable treatment that Germany has been subjected to as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. Then they provide us with 16 years after the start of German suffering. This is again a reference specifically to the Treaty of Versailles, which imposed such harsh sanctions on Germany that really people were concerned whether Germany was going to survive at all. So they're summoning up this image of the hated Treaty of Versailles.
Now, if you'll notice, the music changes, right? It becomes this hopeful music as opposed to the kind of the deep, dark music that it started with and the ominous music that it starts with. It then transitions immediately to, once the slide changes, a hopeful kind of opening and almost, almost jubilant kind of a musical score. And it tells us that 19 months after the start of Germany's rebirth. Well, what's 19 months before September of 1934? Hitler coming to power. And this takes us to the second major point of triumph of the will, which is called the Fuhrer Prinzip. It's the idea that the singularly unifying leader, Hitler himself, the Fuhrer, the leader, is the solution to all of Germany's problems. They can fix all of their problems if only they invest everything into this one dominant leader with absolute total control. And so then it tells us, right? It's presented the problem. It's now providing us with the solution, which is Adolf Hitler flies once again to the city of Nuremberg to review a military display. But in actuality, this is really more like a party congress more than anything else. There are political speeches. There are parades. There are actual military displays because now that he is the Fuhrer, the military is directly under his control. <laughs> So one quick thing about this small sequence is that for most people in the early to mid 1930s in Germany, most of them probably have never been in an airplane. Most of them have never seen footage like this. And to make this connection between what is, for all intents and purposes, the heavens and Hitler himself further reinforces this Fuhrer principle, which is that he's kind of up there in the heavens cavorting with the gods. He knows other things, you know, the other world almost. And so when he brings that back down to us, that really gives him a humongous amount of credibility. Because Triumph of the Will includes so many parade sequences, we're going to go here with our three times obligatory parade speed uh, and just kind of power through the parades because I really don't have a whole lot to add to the parades. And in the interest of giving you the entire film, I'm going to include them, but I'm going to include them at three times speed. This is a really great shot of Hitler's shadow literally being cast down over the town. And of course, what we see as a result of Hitler casting his shadow over the town is everybody is very well organized. Everyone is together. This kind of national unity has taken hold and they're getting things done and they're getting things done in a very, very big way. Once we start getting shots of the crowd waiting for Hitler and his associates to land at the airfield, an important thing to notice is something that plays directly into Hitler's 
and the Nazi party's ideology, which is all of these various and diverse Germans, right? People from the north, from the south, old people, young people, men, women, children, people who are wealthy, people who are working class, people who are poor, huge amounts of diversity within this particular group. But the thing that unifies them all together is the Fuhrer principle, the idea that Hitler is the singularly unifying and organizing principle of Germany. <laughs> Right behind Hitler comes Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was one of the only really highly educated Nazis. Um, his degree was in literature, but again, he's one of the few people who really in the Nazi party who has a really truly advanced degree. He's a creepy guy. He really is a blind devotee of Adolf Hitler and of National Socialism. And to me, again, he just kind of looks like a vampire. quick comment here in the middle of this really long parade is if you'll notice they're putting special emphasis again on children and the fact that children understand the position of the leader and so we all as good Germans must follow the parent figure the Fuhrer and be the good children of the nation. <laughs> So after an enormously long parade, Hitler has finally arrived at the venue. And the thing that I want you to pay most attention to is the SS, the guys all dressed in black, highly shined black leather boots. They've got the swastika featured prominently on their uniforms. These are guys who have sworn a personal oath of allegiance directly to Adolf Hitler, not to the state, not to the government, to him himself. And they're going to be a major focus of later parts of this video.
So I hope that this part one breakdown of Triumph of the Will was enjoyable and informative. I hope you learned something. If you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up button for a like, leave a comment, make sure to subscribe to my channel, and of course, hit the bell notification. I have eight more pieces of Triumph of the Will to evaluate and break down, and hopefully you'll be here along with me when we check it out. And I will see you in the next one. Hi everybody and welcome back to part two of my analysis and commentary on Triumph of the Will. I hope you watched part one. Here in part two we're going to get a couple of big parades and also of course we're going to get mourning in Nuremberg. just got there was called the night parade this is people showing up in Nuremberg understanding that the Fuhrer has arrived and, and for just the off chance of maybe seeing him next what we get is a wide view of many of the very famous landmarks entrenching this Nazi ideology and this Nazi Party Congress in the city of Nuremberg itself. And so we see a whole host of the very famous and important churches and the important buildings that closely associate the historical Nuremberg with now the historical rise of the Nazi Party. The next sequence is actually really, really important, not only to triumph of the will and an understanding of the film, but also to Nazi party ideology. What we're going to see is what we refer to as mourning in Nuremberg. This is the waking up and preparing for the day of Nazi Hitler youth, members of the SS, members of the SA, members of the Reichsarbeitdienst who are getting ready and getting prepared for the day's activities in the Nazi Party Congress. Now a couple of things to take note of. Number one, all of these people are nicely and neatly unified together as a now German nation. They're no longer separated by things like class or regional identities or work or anything else. Everything unifies them as Germans. They can be comfortable together. They can be happy together and they can work together on one singular unified team. This sense of ultranationalism was key to the Nazi party platform. Also take note of the fact that Leni Riefenstahl is really playing up the abundance of what is possible under the Fuhrer's guidance. And so we see an abundance of food and we see a huge number of people and we see that all of these different things are coming together under the auspices of Hitler's governance. <laughs>
This whole sequence really just has a boys will be boys. We're all in this together. Everyone's having a good time. Everybody has a place. Everyone has a position inside of Hitler's Germany. And it really is something which is an enticement. It's supposed to be seductive to the Germans to communicate to them that all they have to do is give Hitler all the power. And this is what the entire country can be like forever and always. <laughs> We get these really awesome shots of the German breakfast, the sausage and the heavy soups and that kind of stuff. It really does look good. And you have to remember that people who are watching this have not only just lived through the Great Depression, they've also lived through the Great Depression in Germany, which was horrifically mistreated by the Treaty of Versailles. They were forced to pay tens of billions of dollars in reparations to the Allies. They were forced to give up land. They were forced to turn over many of their factories to groups like the French in the Ruhr River Valley in the 1920s. They've been humiliated, they've been embarrassed, and then of course on top of it they got the Depression. So to see this level of abundance really is mesmerizing, and it really would have been mesmerizing to people at the time. <laughs> In the next sequence, we see yet another kind of core tenet of Nazi ideology, which is masculinity and upholding and celebrating all things which are masculine. Because according to Nazi ideology, it is through the masculine that the nation will conquer and be strong and prosperous. <laughs> It's a very small point, but in the middle of this extremely masculine sequence, we also have to remember that Hitler is supposed to be a unifier, and so there has to be a place for everybody. So Lenny Riefenstahl includes what I can only call the nerd Nazi, who's sitting there writing in his journal, you know, focusing on his penmanship, that kind of thing. Everybody's got to have a position as long as they are German and as long as they are a part of the nation state. <laughs> wrestling, roughhousing, all the good things that young guys like to do. And it, again, it, it's only possible because they've been unified by their Fuhrer, according to what you know the image is of the film. Now, the next little piece here that I want you to see is if you've never heard of chariot racing before, give it a try sometime. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you.
The next sequence that we get is what we refer to as the German Cultural Parade. One of the things that's very, very important to realize is that Germany had only really been a unified country since 1871. Prior to 1871, Germany had never existed as a unified nation. Germans themselves quite often identified themselves according to their regional identities. They were Bavarians or Silesians, or perhaps they were from Baden. But very few people ever actually thought of themselves as being a culturally unified nation-state of German-speaking peoples. Now, unfortunately, I will tell you that I am not an expert in German culture and I cannot identify all of the different regional variants based on the clothing and the style and, and that sort of thing that we're going to see in this particular sequence. I really, really wish that I was. And if anybody out there is an expert and can give us some insight into what all of these different regional identities are, I would love it. But of course, because it's a parade, we're going to have to get through it kind of quick because I unfortunately just don't have a whole lot more to add to it. off a cultural parade with Hitler inspecting the different people who are associated with those different German cultural identities. He shakes hands, he unifies them together according to the Fuhrer Prinzip, and then this is going to be the end of part two. So if you enjoyed this part two, make sure you give me a thumbs up to encourage me to continue and move on to making part three. Leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next one. Hi everybody and welcome back to part three of my commentary on Triumph of the Will. Hopefully you've already checked out part one and part two. In part three, we're actually going to start getting into some of the meat of Triumph of the Will with the opening of the Nazi Party Congress of 1934. As always, if you enjoy this video, make sure you hit the thumbs up button for a like. Make sure you share with at least one other friend. Also, subscribe to the channel so that you can stay up to date with the development of both this project and all of the other projects that we have going on here at Sheepcorn. Without any more hesitation, let's check it out. All right, after a relatively quick parade to get us to the venue and open the Nazi Party Congress, we're finally going to start with the series of speeches from leading members of the party giving updates as to how things are going in Nazi Germany by September of 1934. <laughs>
first up on the roster, we're going to have Deputy Reichsfuhrer Rudolf Hess, and we should really think about him as basically the vice president of Nazi Germany. He is second in command to Adolf Hitler, and he is seen as the successor to Hitler. Interestingly enough, Rudolf Hess stuck around a long time after the war because right before the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, Rudolf Hess actually parachuted into Scotland requesting an audience with Winston Churchill in an attempt to forge an Anglo-German alliance in opposition to communism from the Soviet Union. Because he was not in Germany for the events of the Holocaust, he was exempted from the death penalty and for the charges of crimes against humanity, and spent the rest of his life in Lansdowne Prison, ultimately dying in 1987. Den Kongress des sechsten Parteitages eröffne ich mit dem ehrfurchtsvollen Gedenken an den in die Ewigkeit eingegangenen Generalfeldmarschall und Reichspräsidenten von Hindenburg. Here we see Rudolf Hess starting off his speech commemorating and memorializing Reichsfield Marshal and president of the Weimar Republic, Paul von Hindenburg. It's significant that Hess is paying tribute to Paul von Hindenburg for a couple of reasons. Number one is he really was the most trusted man in Weimar, Germany. He had been a hero of World War I and one of the organizers of the great victory over the Russian army at Tannenberg in 1914. He, along with Erich von Ludendorff, orchestrated and helped to support the overthrow of the Kaiser at the end of the war to create the Weimar Republic. And in the 1920s, he became the president of the Republic to try to solidify popular support for the new government. Now, it's also significant that he and Hitler had somewhat of a tumultuous relationship with each other, having run head to head against each other for the position of president. However, it's also significant to note that it is Paul von Hindenburg who specifically appointed Hitler in an attempt to ward off what people perceived as the growing threat of a communist revolution in the Weimar Republic. Hindenburg was the last power left in Germany that could have stopped Adolf Hitler after becoming chancellor and then following it up by winning the Reichstag for the Nazi party. However, President Hindenburg died in office and at this point, Hitler went to the people to pass a plebiscite in order to combine the offices of Chancellor and Reich's president into one now combined office of the Führer, which in German just means the leader. Wir gedenken des Generalfeldmarschalls als des ersten Soldaten des großen Krieges und gedenken damit zugleich unserer gefallenen Kameraden. Ich begrüße die hohen Vertreter auswärtiger Staaten. Now, it's really tempting here to say that these are representatives of the Axis countries. However, the Axis wasn't yet in place. And in fact, we didn't even have a German-Italian alliance yet. Other than the two that we can identify, the other possibilities are Bulgaria, Finland, Hungary, Iraq, Romania, Croatia, and Slovakia. Welche? Now, it's actually really hard to track this down, but I'm pretty sure that this one is Galeazzo Ciano, who was not only Mussolini's son-in-law, but at the time he was the undersecretary for press and propaganda under Il Duce's government in Italy. Die Ehre erweisen, an der Tagung teilzunehmen. In aufrichtiger Kameradschaft begrüßt die Bewegung besonders die Vertreter this point is very significant because of Hitler has combined the offices of Chancellor and President into the now combined office of Führer, giving the party, and therefore him personally, direct control over the military of Germany. My Führer. Um sie stehen die Fahnen und Standarten dieses Nationalsozialismus, wenn ihr Tuch einst morsch sein wird. Erst dann werden die Menschen ganz fähig sein, rückblickend 
die Größe unserer Zeit zu verstehen und zu begreifen, was Sie, mein Führer, für Deutschland bedeuten. The point about cloth in the flags rotting, what he means is if those flags are allowed to hang in this hall and we are allowed to retain power and control for a long period of time, it's only then that people will really understand the benefits of not only national socialism, but also of the Fuhrer Prinzip. When we entrust you with so incredibly much power, those dividends will not be paid out quickly but eventually they will be paid out, and then we will understand the significance of what we've accomplished here in 1934. Sie sind Deutschland. Wenn Sie handeln, handelt die Nation. Wenn Sie richten, richtet das Volk. Again, classic Fuhrer Prinzip, we're going to leave all the thinking to Hitler and we are going to follow because that is our dutiful obligation to the nation state. Let him judge and we will judge the same. Let him act and we will act the same. It's pure groupthink. Unser Dank ist das Gelöbnis, in guten und in bösen Tagen zu Ihnen zu stehen. Komme, was da wolle. Dank Ihrer Führung wird Deutschland sein Ziel erreichen. Heimat zu sein. Heimat zu sein für alle Deutschen der Welt. This is also no small point because since German nationalism really started to coalesce together in the early part of the 1830s, people had debated whether it was more important to focus on what they called Kleine Deutschland, small Germany, or Grosch Deutschland, large Germany, which would have included the Austrian Empire because Austrians are ethnically German. Hitler has very clearly taken a side in this particular debate and suggested that only when all Germans live together inside of the borders of the Reich will Germany ever be a completed project. Sie waren uns der Garant des Sieges. Sie sind uns der Garant des Friedens. Adolf Hitler! Die Kühl! Die Kühl! Die Kühl! We now move into 11 other high-ranking members of the Nazi party who are responsible for different areas of policy and are going to provide updates in terms of what Hitler's government has been able to accomplish since it took power early in the previous year. The first speaker is going to be Adolf von Wagner, who is a member of the Sturmabteilung, the SA, and he's actually going to take a very important position on behalf of Hitler. At the end of June and early July of 1934, Hitler and the SS undertook an operation called the Night of Long Knives, wherein they purged not only members of the Nazi party, but also a very large chunk of the upper tier leadership within the SA, within the Sturmabteilung. One of the people who was killed in the Night of Long Knives was Ernst Ruhm. Now, Ruhm was significant because he was the leader of the SA, and he took a political position wherein he said, Nazism cannot stop now that we have taken power. Nazism has to have a permanent, ongoing, perpetual revolution. Because Ruhm was liquidated by Hitler, Hitler now has to distance himself from that idea of a permanent and continuing revolution, and that's what Adolf von Wagner is going to do. Es gibt 
gibt keine Revolution als Dauererscheinung, die nicht zur vollkommenen Anarchie führen müsste. So wie die Welt nicht von Kriegen lebt, so leben die Völker nicht von Revolutionen. Es gibt nichts Großes auf dieser Erde, das Jahrtausende beherrschte und in Jahrzehnten entstanden wäre. Der größte Baum hat auch das längste Wachstum hinter sich. Was Jahrhunderten trotzt, wird auch nur in Jahrhunderten stark. Next up, we've got Alfred Rosenberg, who is a Nazi <clears throat> philosopher and the major author of most of their racial theories, as well as the Nuremberg Laws, which systematically took away the rights of Jewish people living inside of Nazi Germany. Das ist unser unerschütterlicher Glaube an uns selbst. Das ist unsere Hoffnung auf die Jugend gerade heute, die stürmisch vorwärts schreiten, ernst berufen sein wird, das Werk fortzusetzen, das in den Sturmjahren der Revolte von 1918 in München gegründet wurde, der ganz Deutschland erfasste und heute schon in weltgeschichtlicher Bedeutung durch die ganze deutsche Nation verkörpert wird. Hallo. Next up, we've got Otto Dietrich, who is the Third Reich's overseer of the press. And one of the things that's important to notice about him is how much he emphasizes the requirement for the press to report the truth. So what does it mean to report the truth? It means that you will and must be held accountable for reporting what the party has officially designated as truth. The press, therefore, becomes an organ and an extension of the party itself to control the hearts and minds of the people. Denn die Wahrheit ist das Fundament, mit dem die Macht der Presse steht und fällt. Und dass man die Wahrheit über Deutschland berichtet, das ist die einzige Forderung, die wir an die Presse auch des Auslandes stellen. Next, we've got Fritz Todd, who was the director of the head office of engineering. His primary responsibility was overseeing the construction of infrastructure and particularly the Autobahn. This is one of the infrastructure projects that really allowed Nazi Germany to become very, very efficient in its industrial production and transportation and became a central and key point in the Nazi party's accomplishments. <laughs> Mit dem Bau der Reichsautobahn ist an 51 Stellen im Reich begonnen. Obwohl die Arbeit noch in den Anfängen steckt, sind heute schon 52.000 Mann auf den Baustellen und weitere 100.000 Mann in den Lieferbergen, bei der Baustoffindustrie, bei den Brückenbauanstalten oder sonst durch das erst beginnende Werk. Next up, we've got a very brief appearance from Fritz Reinhard, who was the state secretary in the German finance ministry. He's going to talk about how work is being done everywhere. And again, in the context of just coming out of the Great Depression, this really shows people the prosperity that they're associating not only with the rise of Nazism, but also with Hitler's ascendancy to being the Fuhrer. Wohin wir blicken, überall wird gebaut. Überall werden Werte verbessert und Werte neu geschaffen. Überall herrscht seit einem Jahr reges Leben und wird auch in Zukunft reges Leben herrschen. Next we have Richard Walter Dare who is the Reich's Minister for Food and Agriculture, and he is going to give us some of the elements of socialism that is inherent in National Socialism, which is this close connection between the industrial production and the food production, the agricultural production, and the unity of production from both of those different elements of the economy. The für den deutschen Binnenhandel und für den deutschen Export. 
After Dare, we hear from Julius Stryker, who was the publisher of an anti-Semitic newspaper called Der Stürmer. Stryker is important to us because he represents the Nazi racial ideology. And he talks about how the purity of race is an essential bedrock for the foundation of the Reich. Ein Volk, das nicht auf die Reinheit, seine Rasse hält, geht zugrunde. Our next speaker is Robert Ley, who was the head of the German Labor Front. The German Labor Front was a Nazi party apparatus that replaced all of the independent trade and labor unions inside of Germany. This allowed the party to directly control workers through their trade unions and exercise control over the labor force. His primary focus is on the socialism aspect of National Socialism, which is the unity and equality of all labor. Next we have Hans Frank, and Hans Frank is a significant contribution to this because he was the chief jurist of Nazi Germany. What that means is he was basically like the chief justice of the Supreme Court he is intended to be independent and impartial. But what he actually says here is that the decision-making powers of the judiciary are now subservient to the will of the Fuhrer because Hitler himself is responsible for bringing freedom and justice and order. Ich kann nur als Führer des deutschen Rechtsdiener sagen, dass da das Fundament des nationalsozialistischen Staates die nationalsozialistische Rechtsordnung ist, Für uns unser oberster Führer auch der oberste Gerichtsherr ist. Und dass wir, die wir wissen, wie heilig gerade unserem Führer die Grundsätze dieses Rechtslebens sind, auch Ihnen Volksgenossen versichern können, Ihr Leben, auch Ihr bürgerliches Dasein ist gesichert in diesem nationalsozialistischen Staat der Ordnung, der Freiheit und des Rechts. Our penultimate speaker is Dr. Joseph Goebbels, who was the Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. In the 1930s, propaganda was seen as a new tool to create and craft a well-organized and functioning society. Propaganda at the time did not have the kind of nefarious undertones that we associate with it today, and was really seen as a way of winning the hearts and minds of the people. Dr. Goebbels is significant because he is one of the only highly educated Nazis. There were, of course, other educated Nazis, but Goebbels is one of the very, very few to actually have earned his PhD. Goebbels' PhD was earned in the field of philology, which is all about the study of both verbal and written language. Goebbels was one of the most personally devoted and dedicated Nazi leaders to Hitler and to the idea of National Socialism. To me, he comes off as an incredibly creepy and almost vampire-like figure who really does demonstrate this blind devotion to his ideology. Möge die helle Flamme unserer Begeisterung niemals zum Erlöschen kommen. Sie allein gibt auch der schöpferischen Kunst einer modernen politischen Propaganda Licht und Wärme. Aus den Tiefen des Volkes stieg sie empor und zu den Tiefen des Volkes muss sie immer wieder herniedersteigen, um dort ihre Wurzeln zu suchen und ihre Kraft zu finden. Es mag gut sein, Macht zu besitzen, die auf Gewehren ruht. Besser aber und beglückender ist es, das Herz eines Volkes zu gewinnen und es auch zu behalten. That's it for part three. In part four, we're going to start off with the very last speaker who is the leader of the Reichsarbeitdienst or the Reich's Labor Service who's going to lead us into the next scene, which is all about the German workers being unified and organized together under the party. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I also hope that you learned something. If you did, please again leave a thumbs up for a like, subscribe to the channel, Make sure you hit the bell notification for updates on when all of our new videos post. 
leave a comment down below, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi everybody, and welcome back to part four of my commentary on Triumph of the Will. I hope you've checked out parts one through three, and I will leave links up in the corner for you to go and check those out if you're just finding this video for the first time. If you enjoy this series and if you enjoy my other videos, please consider hitting like, subscribing to the channel, leave a comment down below, and share with one other friend. Today's episode is going to encompass the speech from Konstantin Hurl, who was the head of the Reichsarbeitdienst, or Reich's Labor Service, who's going to put on a demonstration and presentation of the working men of Nazi Germany. We're then going to follow that up with what is called the Night Parade and the speech to the SA. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's check it out. Das deutsche Volk ist heute geistig und seelisch reif für die Einführung der allgemeinen gleichen Arbeitsdienstpflicht. The general requirement to work is actually a really important feature of Nazi ideology because it demonstrates the perceived relationship between the individual and society and the emphasis on the fact that the individual must earn their place within the nation state. Nazism was heavily concerned with what we call the freeloader effect, where individuals were gaining benefits from society and participating in society without necessarily ponying up anything in return or in exchange. Wir harren des Befehls des Führers. When we transition to the meeting of the workers, it starts off with this really powerful image of the flag of the Reichsarbeitdienst. It really does carry with it a feeling of a military standard and a unit insignia within a military unit. However, if you look carefully at it, what you'll notice is it is made up of a spade and wheat representing that these are not fighting soldiers. However, this is a militarized workforce creating farmland to feed Germans and to facilitate the industry made possible by the Third Reich. The two points here which are most prescient are of course that these workmen, these ditch diggers, these plowmen have been militarized. They're standing in military formation. We'll see here in a minute that they're all wearing a uniform. They're manipulating their shovels as though they are rifles in a drill formation. They're barking back in unison. And all of them are proud and brave and strong and equal and should be looked up to. It doesn't matter that these men do not have glamorous jobs. This is the socialism part of National Socialism or Nazism, which is that all work that directly benefits the nation should be supported and upheld. Now, it shouldn't necessarily be equally rewarded in the way that a communist would say, but definitely when your work benefits the good of the nation state, it is something to be celebrated and uplifted. That's the socialism part of National Socialism. And this is then related to the second point, which is all of this has been possible because of the unifying effect of Hitler as the leader, as the Fuhrer, which again takes us back to this thing what we call the Fuhrer Princip. If only we give power and authority and trust to Hitler, he will subsume within himself all power and control to make things perfect for Germany and for all Germans. Kamerad, woher stammst du? 
aus Friesenland. Und du, Kamerad, aus Bayern. Und du, vom Kaiserstuhl. Und du, aus Pommern. Und aus Königsberg. Aus Schlesien. Von de Waterkant. Vom Schwarzwald. Aus Dresden. Von der Donau. Vom Rhein. Und von der Saar. So again, with the list of places where these people come from, what we're seeing is this unifying concept of the Führer Prinzip. People from all different kinds of German states from all over the entire country have been unified and forged together into this now unified nation state of Germany, which gives them pride and strength and the ability to accomplish what the Nazis would call greatness because through this ideology of national socialism, we have taken diverse and disparate different German cultures and now finally organized and unified them together behind a supreme leader that can produce the thousand year long German empire that Hitler was predicting. And there it is, the culmination of all of these different ideas and motifs into one simple, easy to remember statement. One people, one leader, one empire, one Germany. This is the essence of Nazism and its appeal to the German people who, since the Treaty of Versailles, have been told that Germans are bad, everything they do is wrong, and they have been punished by that Treaty of Versailles. Heute. Gemeinsam am Werk. Im Ruf. Und wir im Bruch. Im Bruch. Und wir im Sand. Im Sand. Wir deichen die Nordsee. Trotz lange Hand. Wir pflanzen Bäume. Rauschende Wälder. Wir bauen Straßen. Von Dorf zu Dorf. Von Stadt zu Stadt. Wir schaffen dem Bauern neuen Acker. Wälder und Wälder, Acker und Brot für Deutschland. So men from various industries from all over Germany have now been unified together and they're going to accomplish Hitler's promise, which is bread and land for Germans. Now, just to demonstrate that everybody is together and unified, they're going to do something which would otherwise be extremely awkward, but thank goodness they've been practicing in their off time. So what are we going to do? How are we going to show this now unified national identity through work? We're going to sing a little song. nicht im Schützengraben und nicht im Trommelfeuer der Granaten und sind trotzdem Soldaten mit unseren Hämmern, Hexen, Hobeln, Hacken, Spaten. Wir sind des Reiches junge Mannschaft wie ein bei Langemark. Here again, we see a little bit of that flavor of the unification of all Germans, regardless of what they're doing for the state. Provided you are working for the German state, you are a good and important and valuable member of society. They're also reaching back and establishing connections to World War I, when he says, even though we're not fighting men, we stood at Langemark. The Battle of Langemark happened in Western Belgium in 1917 during World War I. It was an attack by the French and British against the Germans, which then the German counterattack reclaimed most of the territory that was lost. The Battle of Tannenberg in August of 1914 was a major victory for the German and Central Powers forces because the Russian army had been mobilized far faster than anyone had predicted. And the real strategy of the German side in World War I was to quickly knock France out of the war so that they could turn all of their attention to what they perceived to be the much larger and more dangerous Russian Imperial Army. 
However, the German army failed to knock France out of the war early, and the Russians mobilized far quicker than anyone could have predicted, and so when they won the monumental Battle of Tannenberg under General Paul von Hindenburg, it was a huge victory for the German and Central Powers cause. The Battle of Liège in 1914 was the opening invasion of the German army making its way through Belgium to try to surround the French army and to end the war quickly as part of the von Schlieffen plan. The Battle of Verdun took place from February to December of 1916. It is the longest battle of the First World War and also one of its bloodiest. An estimated 350,000 German casualties took place in this battle, as well as another 400,000 French casualties. This battle ultimately is used as an example of the futility of World War I on the Western Front, because after almost a million people died, the battle ended up almost exactly where it started in the city of Verdun. The Battle of the Somme from July through November of 1916 is one of the bloodiest battles in all of human history. It was an attempt by the British and the French armies in the field to break through the trench lines and to quickly establish an Allied victory in World War I. 1.5 million British, 1.4 million French, and 1.5 million German soldiers participated in this battle, making it one of history's largest. By November, 420,000 British soldiers, 200,000 French soldiers, and between five and 700,000 German soldiers had become casualties in yet another battle that was not able to decisively establish anything. One very famous veteran of the Battle of the Somme was J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. An der Bühne in Flandern, im Westen, im Osten, im Süd, zu Lande, zu Wasser und in den Wolken. So after summoning up the image of all of these World War I battles, which all of these people would have been familiar with, and had wreaked such havoc on Germany, they're now drawing the connection to say, we are now the embodiment of those German forces from World War I. We're just fighting the battle a little differently. We're fighting the battle to feed Germany, to allow Germany to become prosperous so that Germany can take its rightful place as the dominant country on Earth. Meine Arbeitsdienstmänner, zum ersten Mal seid ihr in dieser Form zum Appell vor mir und damit vor dem ganzen deutschen Volke angetreten. Ihr repräsentiert eine große Idee und wir wissen, dass für Millionen unserer Volksgenossen die Arbeit nicht mehr ein trennender Begriff sein wird, sondern ein alle gemeinsam verbindender. Und dass insbesondere keiner mehr dann in Deutschland leben wird, der in der Arbeit der Faust Minderes sehen wird, als in irgendeiner anderen Arbeit. Durch eure Schule wird die ganze Nation gehen. Die Zeit wird kommen, da kein Deutscher hineinwachsen kann in die Gemeinschaft dieses Volkes, der nicht erst durch eure Gemeinschaft gegangen ist. Und ihr werdet wissen, in diesem Augenblick sehen euch nicht die Augen der Hunderttausende in Nürnberg, sondern in dem Augenblick seht euch zum ersten Mal Deutschland. Und ich weiß, so wie ihr in stolzer Ergebenheit diesem Deutschland Dienst tut, wird heute Deutschland 
in stolzer Freude seine Söhne in euch marschieren sehen. It's not hard to imagine why Hitler has such support and draws such power from the people. Look at what he's telling them. These regular workmen, these, these people who in all other times and in most other places would have been told just go to work and keep your mouth shut and do what you're supposed to do because you're not terribly important. Hitler tells them that they are the example for the nation, that they are the roadmap for how Germany will move forward to reach its greatness. This is an enormously powerful message and it really gives him an enormous amount of influence over the minds of the people. Now, because of course it's still Nazi propaganda, we can't get by without at least one parade, so here it comes. We then move into yet another parade, which is referred to as the Night Parade, leading us into the first meeting of the SA following the Night of Long Knives, where many members and leadership positions, especially within the Sturmabteilung, have been purged. The SA's new leader now is going to devote his loyalty directly to Hitler and ultimately proclaim that the SA is an organization and institution directly devoted to and loyal to Hitler. Now that the new leader of the SA has proclaimed not only his own personal, but also the organization's loyalty to, to the Fuhrer, there's only one thing left to do, and of course, that is a parade out, followed by fireworks. As always, I hope you've enjoyed part four of my commentary on Triumph of the Will. If you did, please consider hitting the thumbs up button, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, and sharing the video with at least one friend. I hope to see you back in part five where we will dive into the meeting of the Hitler Youth. Hi everybody and welcome back to part five of Triumph of the Will. In this episode, we're going to see the meeting of the Hitler Jugend, or Hitler's Youth Group. As always, if you like what you see, make sure you hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share with at least one friend to help keep this channel growing and successful. And now, we'll get started with Reich Jugendfuhrer Balder von Skierich. Let's check it out. So obviously the Hitler Youth was a youth movement in Nazi Germany that was mandatory for all full-blooded German citizens. It was originally formed on July the 4th, 1926, and became a paramilitary organization for children in the Reich between the ages of 14 and 18. 
Boys as young as 10 also had their own separate organization to feed them into the Hitler Jugend called the German Youngsters in the Hitler Youth. Balder von Skierig was the Reich's Hitler Jugend Führer from 1931 until 1940. Under his power and control, the Hitler Jugend became Hitler's method for winning the hearts and minds of the youth within the German Empire. This gave him a direct control over the German youth's hearts and minds and allowed him to really solidify his position into the future. What's really extraordinary about this is the degree to which children are fully incorporated into the political events of the party congress. If we look at the way that most youth are treated today when it comes to politics, they're separated and discounted and not given very much importance. Hitler, of course, is going to promote them to this position of you are the future and you are really critically important to the Reich, which makes them feel very individually and even as a group important to the work that's being done in Germany and motivates them to really fall in line behind the Fuhrer Prinzip. The second important point about von Skierig's introduction here is that he's continuing to lay the importance of a classless youth at the feet of Hitler's accomplishments because of course being German is enough. Once you're in the club there's no further division that is necessary in order to facilitate the thousand year empire that Hitler intends to build. Now, die höchste Selbstlosigkeit dieser Nation voranleben, will auch diese Jugend selbstlos sein, weil sie die Treue für uns verkörpern. Darum wollen auch wir treu sein. Adolf Hitler, der Führer der deutschen Jugend, hat das Wort. <lacht> Jugend. Nach einem Jahr kann ich euch hier wieder begrüßen. Ihr seid heute hier in dieser Muschel nur ein Ausschnitt dessen, was außer ihr über ganz Deutschland steht. Und wir möchten nun, dass ihr deutsche Jungs und deutsche Mädchen in euch all das aufnehmt, was wir der eins uns von Deutschland hoffen. Wir wollen ein Volk sein. Und ihr, meine Jugend, sollt dieses Volk nun werden. Wir wollen eins keine Klassen und Stände mehr sehen. Und ihr dürft sie in euch schon nicht mehr groß werden lassen. Wir wollen eins ein Reich sehen. Und ihr müsst euch schon dafür erziehen. Wir wollen, dass dieses Volk eins gehorsam ist und ihr müsst euch in dem Gehorsam üben. Hitler here is emphasizing the quintessential Nazi value, which is obedience to authority, the Führer Prinzip. Fall in line, become unified as a German nation and we will dominate this world and we will create a home for all German people. Wir wollen, dass dieses Volk einst 
Fried lieben und aber auch tapfer ist. Und ihr müsst friedfertig sein. The thing that's very difficult for us to forget and to keep in perspective while we're watching this part of Hitler's speech is, it's only 1934. Hitler has only just become the Fuhrer. He hasn't really done anything aggressive yet, at least when it comes to international politics. He hasn't remilitarized the Rhineland, that was in 1936. He hasn't participated in the Spanish Civil War, that was also 1936. He hasn't orchestrated the Anschluss, that was 1938. He hasn't invaded the Sudetenland, that was 1938 and 1939. He hasn't invaded Poland, that's 1939. And of course, the World War starts at the end of 1939. So up until this point, he's talking about creating a peace-loving people who is willing and able to suffer the problems of privation, of difficulty, and to be able to make it through to the other side. And a lot of people look at him and say, you know, he talks a big game, but he's just another politician. He's just trying to rally his people. The guy who believed that more than anybody else was Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Other people, like Winston Churchill, already in 1935 and 36, started to scream for, at the top of their lungs that Hitler was dangerous, that he meant what he said when he talked about aggressive expansion of the German Empire. And what we also do and what we do, we will begin. Aber in euch wird Deutschland weiterleben. Und wenn von uns nichts mehr übrig sein wird, dann werdet ihr die Fahne, die wir einst aus dem Nichts hochgezogen haben, in euren Fäusten halten müssen. Und ich weiß, das kann nicht anders sein, denn ihr seid Fleisch von unserem Fleisch und Blut von unserem Blut und in eurem jungen Gehirn brennt dasselbe Geist, der uns beherrscht. Ihr könnt nicht anders sein, als mit uns verbunden. Und wenn die großen Kolonnen unserer Bewegung heute siegen durch Deutschland marieren, dann weiß ich, ihr schließt euch den Kolonnen an und wir wissen, vor uns liegt Deutschland, in uns marschiert Deutschland und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. Wow, if you want to talk about a really powerful message for young people. One day we will be dead, but you will live on. You are the future, and it is really, really important that you do your best to carry on the good work that we lifted out of nothing. That's an incredibly powerful message, and he leaves it with this great ovation to the German state. Before us lies Germany. In us, Germany burns. And behind us, Germany falls follows. This unity between the Fuhrer and the youth really does help to solidify his power and it's one of the reasons why Hitler is such a powerful leader. And of course part five is going to end with, you guessed it, another parade.
episode six, we're going to see the Wehrmacht technology being put on display as well as the parade to the Cathedral of Light. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please stay tuned for part six. Leave a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe to the channel to help support it and keep me motivated to finish this project. Leave a comment down below and share with at least one friend. Thanks so much for sticking with me through this entire project. I'm really overwhelmed by the response that it's getting. Thank you so much to everybody who's subscribed, and I will see you in the next one. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to episode six. In this episode, we're going to get a couple of parades, a couple of speeches, and the military display from the opening sequence. If you like this episode, make sure you hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share with at least one friend to keep the channel growing. And now for part six of Triumph of the Will. Let's check it out. Now that Hitler has become the Fuhrer of Germany and combined the offices of President and Chancellor, the military is directly under his control, and as such he started a massive remilitarization process in direct violation of the Treaty of Versailles. This remilitarization took the form of new technological innovations which he is now going to show off at the Party Congress in 1934. Strangely enough, Lenny Riefenstahl starts off with a demonstration of standard horse cavalry and then moves into the new technological innovations that the Third Reich has been developing when it comes to the Wehrmacht. Next up we get one of the most famous parades from Triumph of the Will, which is called the Parade to the Cathedral of Light. This image was central to Lenny Riefenstahl's plan for the film because it shows Germans marching en masse towards the cathedral illuminated by bright searchlights. This carries with it religious overtones of people going to mass. And because they're going to mass, they're also expected to see their god, who is now the state and the Fuhrer as its living embodiment. Now that we've reached the Cathedral of Light, Hitler is going to deliver what we refer to as the Night Speech, and he's trying to explain to other people exactly what they're doing there, as well as set himself up for a reconciliation with the Sturmabteilung. One of the really interesting things that I want you to notice here is how Hitler is using the editorial we in conjunction with the nation, but also to mean himself, because when he starts to talk about how we command the state, he's not really talking about the German people, and he's not even talking about the German nation. He is talking about himself as the living embodiment of the state and of the nation within the context of what we referred to before as the Fuhrer Prinzip. For Raten wir uns zum ersten Mal auf diesem Felde. Der erste Generalappell der politischen Leiter der Nationalsozialistischen Partei. 200.000 Männer sind nun versammelt, die nicht hergerufen hat als das Gebot ihres Herzens. Nicht hergerufen hat. Als das 
Gottes war die große Not unseres Volkes, die uns einst ergriffen hat und die uns zusammenführte im Kampfe ringen und groß werden ließ. Daher können das alle, die nicht verstehen, die nicht die gleiche Not in ihrem Volk gelitten haben. Ihnen erscheint es rätselhaft und geheimnisvoll, was diese Hunderttausende denn zusammenführen, was in Not Leiden und Bärungen ertragen lässt. Sie können sich das nicht anders denken, als durch einen staatlichen Befehl. Sie irren sich. Nicht der Staat befiehlt uns, sondern wir befehlen den Staat. Nicht der Staat hat uns geschaffen, sondern wir schaffen uns unseren Staat. Nein, die Bewegung, sie lebt und sie steht felsenfest begründet. Und solange auch nur einer von uns atmen kann, wird er diese Bewegung seine Kräfte leihen. In transitioning to discussing that the movement, which means Nazism, still lives and does have and maintain control of the state, Hitler is starting to transition himself into discussing whether Nazism is still viable because of the Night of Long Knives and the purge that was required to happen within the Nazi leadership itself. Und für sie eintreten, so wie in den Jahren, die hinter uns liegen, Trommel die Trommel kommen, so fahren die Fahre, dann wird zur Gruppe Gruppe stoßen, zum Gau der Gau, und dann wird endlich diese gewaltige Kolonne der geeinten Nation nachfolgen, das früher zerrissene Volk. Es würde ein Frevel sein, wenn wir jemals sinken ließen, was mit so viel Arbeit, so viel Sorgen, so viel Opfern und so viel Not erkämpft und errungen werden musste. Man kann nicht dem untreu werden, was einem ganzen Leben Inhalt, Sinn und Zweck gegeben hat. Es wird nicht so etwas aus nichts, wenn diesem Werden nicht ein großer Befehl zugrunde liegt. Und den Befehl gab uns kein irdischer Vorgesetzter. Den gab uns der Gott, der unser Volk geschaffen hat. Here Hitler is profoundly focused on loyalty and order because we are only a few months out from his movement to purge less than perfectly loyal members of particularly the SA, but the entire Nazi party, including Ernst Röhm. And that showed a lot of people in Germany that maybe Nazism has some cracks in the wall. So sei dein unser Erlebnis an diesem Abend, in jeder Stunde, an jedem Tag, nur zu denken an Deutschland, an Volk und an Reich, an unsere deutsche Nation, unser deutsches Volk, Sieg heil! Sieg heil! Sieg heil!
The night speech is the closing of the third day of the Nazi Party Congress of 1934, and so in this particular speech, he doesn't go fully into the reconciliation of the SA and the rest of the party around himself as its now unquestioned leader. He's going to leave that for day four, and for us, that's going to be in the later episodes of this project. So since we've had a rousing speech where Hitler has set himself up for the big finale, day four, we now have to transition out of the Cathedral of Light with, that's right, another parade. So I hope you enjoyed episode six. This is kind of the end of the middle and, and all the pieces are now in place for the huge finale, the final act of Triumph of the Will. If you did enjoy this episode, make sure you hit the thumbs up button to give me a like, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel and share it with at least one friend so that the channel continues to grow and I can keep making projects like this. In the next episode, episode seven, we will begin with the visit to the Toenrum, the review of the SA and the SS, and the justification for the Knight of Long Knives. I hope you'll come back for episode 7, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi everybody, welcome back to part 7 of Triumph of the Will. This is a big one, and we're starting to get into climax territory. If you like what you see in this video, hit the thumbs up button. Make sure to leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, Share with at least one friend so the YouTube algorithm continues to show our videos to other people. And without any further ado, let's check it out. In episode 7, we're going to see the visit to the Ehrenhalle, the Hall of Honor, which was built to honor Nuremberg's dead from World War I. This visitation was called the Totenrung and comprised Hitler, Himmler, who is the leader of the SS, and Viktor Luzzi, who was the new leader of the SA, visiting the memorial to the dead of World War I in order to pay homage to the men who died in the First World War. Next up, we're going to see the assembly and review of the SA, the Sturmabteilung, and the SS, the Schutzstaffel. This event is very important because the Knight of Long Knives has just purged the leadership of the SA, and men in the SA were worried that the rest of them may be executed as well. In this particular set of speeches, Hitler is going to reconcile the SA to the party and ultimately forge a path ahead for National Socialism. After the SA has made their way into the assembly area, next up we see the SS. Dressed all in black, goose-stepping in unison, these guys look scary, 
and the SA had to have been sweating because their leadership had just been purged and the question was outstanding of what was going to happen to the Sturmabteilung. Would they be sacrificed to unify the party behind Hitler or were they going to be reconciled? I can't imagine what it was like to be standing there with the SS walking in surrounding the SA. It had to have been pretty nerve-wracking. <laughs> So now Viktor Lutzi has performed his public oath of loyalty to Hitler. He has sworn that the SA is a loyal institution, an organization, and that they are ready to follow Hitler's orders. This is to preserve them from being completely and totally liquidated by the party in pursuance of the singular control of Hitler under the Fuhrer Princip. SA und SS Vor wenigen Monaten hat sich über der Bewegung ein schwarzer Schatten erhoben. Here he's acknowledging the Night of Long Knives, the blood purge where people like Ernst Röhm, who had been the leader and head of the SA, had been murdered in the middle of the night by SS officers to consolidate Hitler's power and to keep him uniformly in charge of National Socialism. Die SA hat so wenig als irgendeine andere Institution der Partei mit diesen Schatten etwas zu tun. For anybody standing there in an SA uniform, that has to have been an enormous relief because, again, these guys don't know if they're coming to Nuremberg to ultimately be executed and purged or consolidated into the SS. When Hitler acknowledges that the SA as an institution is not responsible for the events of their leaders, this is Hitler extending his hand and reunifying them back under party control. Dass auch nur ein Riss in das Gefüge unserer einzigen Bewegung gekommen sei. Sie steht fest, so wie dieser Block hier. Und sie wird in Deutschland durch nichts zerbrochen. Und wenn jemand sich am Geiste meiner SA versündigt, dann trifft das nicht. in der Überzeugung, dass ich sie 
in die treuesten Hände gebe, die es in Deutschland gibt. Denn in den Zeiten hinter uns, da habt ihr mir eure Treue tausendfältig bewiesen. Und in der Zeit vor uns kann es nicht anders sein und es wird auch nicht anders sein. Next up, we've got a very strange ceremony, which is the consecration of the Standarten, the flags of National Socialism. In order to make a Nazi flag a real bona fide Nazi flag, it had to have been touched to the Blutfahne, which was the blood flag. The Blutfahne was allegedly the flag carried by the Nazis in Munich in the 1923 Beer Hall Putsch. The Nazis thought that they could take over the local government of the city of Munich and that they would have the backing of local officials. However, the police came out and actually shot several Nazis in the streets and dissipated this revolution. The myth goes that one of those Nazis bled onto the flag of National Socialism that he was carrying, creating the Blutfahne, which then all other National Socialist Standarten had to be touched to in an act of consecration for the blood spilled on behalf of National Socialism. Now that we have the National Socialist flags consecrated, that's it for episode 7. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, again, please leave a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share with at least one friend. We only have two episodes left to go. Episode 8 is going to be filled with, you guessed it, parades. And finally, the ninth episode of this project is going to encompass Hitler's closing speech to the National Socialist Party Congress of 1934. Thanks so much for sticking with me, and I'll see you in the next one. Hi, everybody, and welcome back as we take another crack at episode 8 of Triumph of the Will. The first time I uploaded this video, YouTube decided that it was hate speech and took it down. I'm now reshooting and re-editing it so that I can intersperse my commentary within this gigantic parade. Before I edited and cut this video together, this section of Triumph of the Will was 17 minutes and 20 seconds of nothing but parades. No dialogue, no major events, just parades. If you like this video, please leave me a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share with at least one friend so that YouTube continues to expand my audience. So with no further hesitation, let's check it out.
When I first watched this section of Triumph of the Will, I decided that there was absolutely nothing here worth talking about, which is why I just basically left it unedited the first time I uploaded it to YouTube. However, I've been thinking very carefully about it, and I think there are a couple of comments that need to be made. Initially, my impression was this parade sequence was really no different than the beginning of the film when Hitler enters Nuremberg to begin the Nazi Party Congress. However, what we need to notice is this sequence of parades is vastly different. We still have the recurring themes of unity and national strength organized under the Fuhrer Prinzip. However, when we view this particular sequence of parades, what we need to remember is Lenny Riefenstahl is showing us some very different shots than what we got in the first sequence. In the first sequence, Hitler was coming to Nuremberg and we saw everything from basically his perspective as he was being welcomed by the German people. This time, now that we've healed the wounds of the party and established the Fuhrer Princip as being good for Germany, we're going to start seeing things from different perspectives, which ultimately helps to set us up for episode 9, which is the culmination of this entire film. The first group of people that we see parading past Hitler is the SA. They've now been wholly reintegrated into the party, and the party itself is now healed, unified, and whole, which means they can demonstrate their strength and their devotion to Hitler through their uniformity of parade. adding to the participants of the parade, including the Reichsarbeitdienst as well as other SA units. But the thing that's very subtle and very easy to overlook, and in fact I did the first several times I viewed it, is Lenny Riefenstahl is not showing us this parade from Hitler's point of view. We are viewing it from the point of view of one of the people of Nuremberg in the audience who is looking down at the events of the parade. Because we are a viewer, we are also then becoming a participant. This is one of the tricks to suck people into the movement and to understand that there's a difference between the passive people who are just watching and the active people who are fighting the <clears throat> good fight of the party and leading us into this brighter future that Hitler's promising us in Triumph of the Will. This is a theme that he's going to repeat in his final closing speech in episode 9, which is there's a difference between those who are actively members of the party and those who just allow us to do what we want to do. And of course, one of those kinds of people is far more preferable than the other. That's the triumph of this will that the title of the film refers to. The second major piece that we're seeing already in this parade sequence is the integration of the military into the party apparatus. That blending of party institutions and governmental institutions was not only critical to, to National Socialist ideology, but the speed and ease with which the film just cuts together party organs and state organs really helps to demonstrate the level to which this full integration was essential to Hitler maintaining and gaining even more power over Germany.
At the end of this particular sequence, we're also seeing a really important feature, which is again about this integration of the party and the state. We're starting to see the creation of the earliest examples of Waffen-SS units, wherein whole units of the military were members of the SS organization. This gave Hitler and the party a direct control over very elite units within the Wehrmacht. Now we're getting the really masterful craftsmanship of Lenny Riefenstahl. If you noticed in that last segment, she not only showed us different oblique angles and set the camera in very interesting places to give us unusual perspectives on the parade, she also put us in the parade. She is drawing the distinction between these kind of quick shots that we see of the audience members, of people who are just passively accepting National Socialism. But she's now putting us in the perspective of a participant in the parade itself. We are now a member of the party. We are now being drawn into allegiance with the party apparatus. It's very subtle. It's very sneaky. It's very, very masterful filmmaking. But it's also why Triumph of the Will has such incredible power. By this point, I'm pretty sure that Lenny Riefenstahl is just trying to overwhelm us with the sheer numbers of people who are in attendance. The 1934 Party Congress did draw 700,000 people to the city of Nuremberg, so that is definitely an impressive feat. However, in the unedited version of this particular sequence, it's over 17 minutes long. I have to wonder at what point in the editing process Lenny Riefenstahl finally said, we're good, we don't need to cut any more out, and what she had left was 17 minutes and 20 seconds. It's an enormous parade and she's just bludgeoning us with the size and strength and togetherness of this entire crowd inside of Nuremberg. The second major piece is we're starting to get some wider shots, and I'm left to think that the reason for these wider shots is to embed this Nazi Party Congress and the parade and the uniformity within the cultural context of Germany. The parade itself is being conducted in front of Frauenkirche, which is the Church of Our Lady inside of Nuremberg. To nestle these events within something that is so both religiously and culturally important to Germans helps to further consolidate the unification of all aspects of German culture.
we end this sequence with Heinrich Himmler walking up to Hitler and providing his salute, then being trailed by huge numbers of members of the SS itself. I believe that the reason for that is Hitler felt the SS was the truest example of what he was looking for in Germans. Absolutely blindly loyal to him, willing to fulfill any and all orders, blindly loyal and fanatical in their ability and willingness to carry out those orders, and pure-blooded Aryans. This is his ideal citizen and his ideal person within the German Reich. And so when we conclude this particular sequence with them, he's setting us up for a lesson on what we're supposed to be in the future in order to fulfill his vision of what Germany's bright future is supposed to look like according to National Socialist ideology. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I do think it came out better because I was forced to find the commentary. I do hope that YouTube doesn't find this particular iteration to be hate speech. If you did like it, please leave me a thumbs up, make a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share with at least one friend to keep me motivated to make more projects like this. In the final episode, episode 9, we're going to witness Hitler's final speech and closing of the Nazi Party Congress of 1934. I hope you'll join me for the final episode in this project, and I will see you in the next one. Hi everybody, and welcome back to part nine of Triumph of the Will. Boy, this has really been a long journey. From the middle of March when my school got kicked out for the rest of the year, and I did the first live stream of Triumph of the Will with my commentary that I normally would have done in class with students, to the massive reaction that I've gotten from posting that on YouTube, to now going back and teaching myself video production skills, as well as editing, sound design, lighting, and all of the other really interesting things that I've learned from this process. I want to take a minute and thank all of the fans who have not only subscribed to the channel, but also liked and watched this second series of the Triumph of the Will commentary. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Dr. Adelaide Heftberger from the German Bundesarchive, who granted me permission to post this commentary on YouTube, because as everybody likes to ask, and nobody likes to read the actual response to, Triumph of the Will is in fact a copywritten piece of material that is owned by the Federal Republic of Germans. You cannot just post Triumph of the Will online without some sort of transformative work, like my commentary videos. And for everybody who has left a comment, both positive and negative, I really, really appreciate you taking time out of your day to engage with my work. Today's episode is basically just Hitler's final speech to the 1934 Nazi Party Congress, and this will be the last video in this series. If you like it, hit the thumbs up button, leave a comment down below giving me your thoughts and reactions to this video, subscribe to the channel, and share with at least one friend so that my channel continues to grow. So without any further ado, let's check it out. So here we are, at the climax to Triumph of the Will. The Fuhrer Princip has now been fulfilled and all we have and all we need is Adolf Hitler front and center leading as the Fuhrer. This is the entire point of Triumph of the Will, is to put the nation at ease because Hitler is that supreme leader that they believe is needed and necessary for Germany to be unified and successful. The wrongs of the past will be undone and a bright future will be created by the party.
military nature of Triumph of the Will, but especially in this last scene, is critically important to understanding its message and its technique of propaganda. By showing that Hitler is basically the supreme general of our nation army, it creates the imperative for all individual people to fall in line and follow orders as good soldiers are supposed to do. Here in the party congress, it is no different from disorganization and disunity with the plots within the SA. We now have bridged the gap between SA and SS, remilitarized everything under the leadership of Hitler, and now Lenny Riefenstahl is trying to show us that we are marching towards the brighter future. Es spricht der Führer. Der sechste Parteitag der Bewegung geht zu Ende. Was für Millionen Deutsche, die außerhalb unserer Reihen stehen, vielleicht nur als imposantestes Schauspiel politischer Machtentfaltung gewertet wird, war für die Hunderttausende der Kämpfer unendlich mehr. Das große persönliche und geistige Treffen der alten Streiter und Kampfgenossen. Und vielleicht hat mancher unter Ihnen trotz der zwingenden Großartigkeit dieser Herrscher unserer Partei sich wehmütigen Herzens zurückbesonnen in jene Tage, da es noch schwer war, Nationalsozialist zu sein. This is kind of a strange thing for Hitler to say. Some of you want to think back kind of in a vaguely longing fashion for the good old days when we were the out group and when it was difficult to be a national socialist. He's trying to draw a contrast between those people who are interested in the struggle, like Ernst Rome, who has just been liquidated, and those who now realize the fulfillment of the 23-point program to try to start creating the world as Hitler has envisioned it. Als unsere Partei gerade sieben Mann hoch war, sprach sie schon zwei Grundsätze aus. Erstens, sie wollte eine wahrhaftige Weltanschauungspartei sein. Und zweitens, sie wollte daher kompromisslos die einzige Macht und alleinige Macht in Deutschland. There's two things that I want to highlight about this particular set of lines from Hitler. The first one is how he became a National Socialist. He was originally hired by the government of Munich to infiltrate the National Socialist Democratic Workers' Party to report back to that government what its activities were. After attending several meetings, he decided he agreed with the ideology and became its leader. So that's kind of ironic that he talks about back in the good old days in the beginning when there were only seven of us, as if he is somehow A, an original member, and B, has been deeply devoted to it from the very beginning. The second part of this set of lines that really needs a little bit of fleshing out is the part about wanting National Socialism to be the uncompromisingly powerful group within Germany. This is key and fundamental, and actually something that doesn't get played up very much within the rest of Triumph of the Will. National Socialism stands in diametric opposition to the principles of the Enlightenment, which means individualism, the rule of law, constitutionalism, and democratic forms of government. National Socialists look at democracies and they say that ultimately because of the requirement to compromise and the fact that democracies take a long time to enact policy, that authoritarian dictatorship is far preferred under the leadership of a singular dictator because ultimately things will get done and problems will be solved. Nazis think that democracies are unable to solve very large problems. It's interesting because the other group of people that really lays this criticism at the feet of democracies is communism. Communism looks at democracy and says that it's an instrument of the haves versus the have-nots, and the only way to fix that system is to violently rise up and overthrow the system. Wir 
mussten als Partei in der Minorität bleiben, weil wir die wertvollsten Elemente des Kampfes und des Opfersinns in der Nation mobilisierten, die zu allen Zeiten nicht die Mehrheit, sondern die Minderheit ausgemacht haben. Und weil dieser beste Rassenwert der deutschen Nation in einer stolzen Selbsteinschätzung mutig und kühn die Führung des Reiches und Volkes forderte, hat das Volk sich in immer größerer Zahl dieser Führung angeschlossen und unterstellt. Das deutsche Volk ist glücklich in dem Bewusstsein, dass die ewige Flucht der Erscheinungen nunmehr endgültig abgelöst wurde von einem ruhenden Pol. Der sich als Träger seines besten Blutes fühlen und dieses Wissen. In terms of pure political philosophy, this is where Nazism really gets to be very strange. It's a combination of the scientific racism of the 19th century, coming from people like Oswald Spengler, who hypothesized that the West was in decline and downfall as a result of the pollution of the pure blood of people from Western Europe. Now in the meantime, all of this nonsense has been completely and totally discredited by things like the field of genetics. Science is one reason why Nazism is completely and totally nonsensical. The idea that a unified nation is somehow entitled to rights in and of itself as a result of the unity and purity of their blood is complete and total nonsense. When we add to this the misapplication of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution through means of natural selection, people in the 19th century applied that, or rather misapplied that, to societies in what was called social Darwinism. Because they could scientifically identify what they referred to as untermenschen, subhumans, people who they thought were less evolutionarily developed than themselves, they also looked at it from the point of view that said, no one cries when the lion eats the wildebeest. When our society feeds off of the lesser societies, according to their perspective, ultimately that is not only a good thing, it is a natural thing, and it is an amoral thing. It's not good or bad, it is just the way the world works. Because we can now genetically determine that the entire concept of races is really null and void, that means there are no Untermenschen. And because there are no Untermenschen, the whole idea of social Darwinism completely and totally falls apart, and that is the major cornerstone of Nazism. Germans and Aryans are under attack from Untermenschen all over the world, and so we have to rally and unify and, and exert our influence over our own national self-determination. It's built on crackpot science that doesn't really work and doesn't really go anywhere, and that's why as a political ideology and a political philosophy, it fails. Zur Führung der Nation erhoben hat und entschlossen ist, diese Führung zu behalten, wahrzunehmen und nicht mehr abzugeben. Es wird stets nur ein Teil eines Volkes aus wirklich aktiven Kämpfern bestehen. Von ihnen wird mehr gefordert als von den Millionen der übrigen Volksgenossen. Für sie genügt nicht die bloße Ablegung des Bekenntnisses, ich glaube, sondern der Schwur, ich kämpfe. This bit is so critically important because I see this so often today from movements that have developed from the anti-enlightenment of the late 19th century and early 20th century. People who want to make justice a performative thing, where you have to behave in a certain way to be a just person. It is not enough to simply have good ideas, you must act in a certain way. You must think in a certain way. This is what all of the anti-enlightenment movements have ultimately arrived at, a performative public justice that has very little social 
and civic value and virtue in favor of simply performing the expected social behaviors. politische Führungsauslese des deutschen Volkes sein. Sie wird in ihrer Lehre unveränderlich, in ihrer Organisation stahlhart, in ihrer Taktik schmiegsam und anpassungsfähig, in ihrem Gesamtbild aber wie ein Orden sein. Das Ziel aber muss sein, alle anständigen Deutschen werden Nationalsozialisten. Nur die besten Nationalsozialisten sind Parteigenossen. haben unsere Gegner dafür gesorgt, dass durch Verbot und Verfolgungswillen von Zeit zu Zeit die Bewegung wieder ausgekämmt wurde von dem leichten Zeug, das sie für ihr einzufinden begann. Heute Entmusterung halten und abstoßen, was sich als schlecht erwiesen hat und es eine und deshalb innerlich nicht zu uns gehört. Es ist unser Wunsch und Wille, dass dieser Staat und dieses Reich bestehen sollen in den kommenden Jahrtausenden. Wir können glücklich sein zu wissen, dass diese Zukunft restlos uns gehört. Wenn die älteren Jahrgänge noch wanken werden könnten, die Jugend ist uns verschrieben und da fallen mit Leib und mit Leben. nationalsozialistischen Gedankens und Wesens verwirklichen, wird sie eine ewige und unzerstörbare Säule des deutschen Volkes und Reiches sein. Dann wird einst neben die herrliche, ruhmreiche Armee, dem alten, stolzen Waffenträger unseres Volkes, die nicht minder traditionsgefestigte politische Führung der Partei treten, und dann werden diese beiden Einrichtungen gemeinsam den deutschen Menschen erziehen und festigen und auf ihren Schultern tragen den deutschen Staat, das deutsche Reich. In dieser Stunde verlassen schon wieder Zehntausende von Parteigenossen die Stadt, während aber die einen noch von der Erinnerung zehren, werden andere schon wieder beginnen zu rüsten zum nächsten Appell. Und wieder werden die Menschen kommen und gehen und stets aufs Neue ergriffen, beglückt und begeistert sein. Denn die Idee und die Bewegung sind Lebensausdruck unseres Volkes und damit ein Symbol des Ewigen. Es lebe die nationalsozialistische Bewegung! Es lebe Deutschland!
And there you have it. He completely and totally lays out his point of view and his perspective on how to run a country. Now what that means is there's only really two things left. Number one, we have to fawn over Hitler for a while and Rudolf Hess doing his best bromance is one of the creepiest things I've ever seen on film. And then we're going to end this with a little song called the Horst Vessel Song in memory of a National Socialist who was allegedly killed in defense of the movement. The final scene is the forces of National Socialism marching in, you got it, a parade to the Horst Vessel song, having achieved the triumph of Hitler's will and marching on to the brighter future that he promised them. Now of course, no video about National Socialism would be complete without acknowledging the horrific cost of this image and the fact that German people believed it. Now, as I have tried to express countless times, I think they had a good reason to believe it. Germany was in bad shape. The depression hit them hard and the Treaty of Versailles treated them horribly. They were in dire straits and they were looking for a Superman to come and save them. The problem is the Superman that they chose turned out to be a Superman who could not deliver what he promised and the cost of trusting him was incalculable. So one last time, I would like to thank everybody who has stuck with me through both iterations of this project and all nine videos in this series. Thank you for your views. Thank you for your likes. Thank you for your subscriptions and comments and support. If you liked this particular episode, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the channel, and share this video and the rest of the series with at least one friend. Thank you so much, everybody. I really cannot express how overwhelmed I am by the response that I've gotten on YouTube, and I do hope to continue doing projects like this in the future. With my deepest admiration to all of you, I'll see you in the next one.